So a man took his whole family on the trip of a lifetime to the Holy Land, including his overbearing mother-in-law. While they were visiting Jerusalem, the mother-in-law passed away quietly in the night. With death certificate in hand, he went to the American consulate to see what arrangements could be made. The Israeli employee said, Sir, it's our custom to bury people immediately. We can arrange to bury your mother-in-law here in Jerusalem for a cost of $5,000. The other option is we can arrange to transport her home for a cost of $25,000. <clears throat> Immediately, the man said, I don't care how much it costs, I want to bring mother home. The woman said, sir, are you absolutely sure? Think about the cost. The man said, yes, I want to bring her home today. The woman said, sir, you must have loved your mother-in-law very much. The man leaned forward in a hushed tone, and he said, it's not that. I heard that a long time ago, they buried a man here in Jerusalem, and he rose again on the third day. I can't take that chance. I'm glad my mother-in-law's not here. We're looking forward to taking a group from HTC to Israel next May 1st, and we promise we'll bring everybody home with us one way or the other. We're here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ this morning. Someone said the most important question about Jesus is, is he alive or is he dead? If he's dead, we can all certainly agree that his was a life of unparalleled influence. But if he's alive, that means that his ministry goes on. That means that he can say and do new things. That means that we can personally encounter him. To be a Christian is to believe and to confess that Jesus is alive. And we have many good reasons to believe. We have the testimony of the New Testament that was written by eyewitnesses to his resurrection, like Peter and John, Matthew, John, Mark, and Paul. We have the testimony of the empty tomb. Jesus' enemies could have very easily settled the debate. All they had to do was to produce the body of Jesus, but he wasn't there. It's telling that a group of Jews who believed Jesus is Lord didn't have any interest in enshrining his tomb. The tomb of Abraham in Hebron is 4,000 years old. We're going to visit it next year. The tomb of David in Jerusalem is 3,000 years old. We're going to see that. But nobody bothered remembering where Jesus' tomb was because it was empty. We believe Jesus is alive. We have the witness of the radical change in his disciples. What would cause a group of nice Jewish boys to begin proclaiming boldly, Jesus is Lord. Literally, their words meant Yahweh is Jesus. He is God. What would cause them to radically change their Jewish theology and practices? What, why were they willing to endure persecution, imprisonment, even martyrdom for the sake of this message? It's because they saw Jesus alive. And then we have the witness of the explosive growth of Christianity and its survival through the ages. Today, one-third of the Earth's population is celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe the resurrection to be a documented fact of history but what does the resurrection mean? What's the spiritual 
significance of the resurrection. The, the resurrection is the what, but, but I want to think this morning about the so what. What difference does the resurrection make for my life 2,000 years later? How does Jesus' resurrection affect me? How does it apply to me? On this Easter Sunday morning, I, I want to share three quick thoughts with you. What does the resurrection mean for us? First of all, the resurrection means that tomorrow has happened today. Tomorrow has happened today. It's important to remember that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was and is an absolutely unique event in the history of the universe. When Jesus rose from the dead, he was the first ever of his kind. No one else before ever had a resurrection experience like Jesus. Now it's true that in the Jewish scriptures, people were raised from the dead. Elisha raised to life the son of a widow who had offered him hospitality. That's the first instance in the Bible of someone being raised from the dead. E e Elisha raised the son of an older couple who offered him hospitality. Hey, you ought to invite yourself a prophet to dinner. You never know what might happen. The Bible says receive a prophet because he's God's prophet and you'll receive a prophet's reward. Jesus himself raised people from the dead. A widow's only son, Jairus' beloved daughter, his own friend Lazarus. But I would submit to you that all of those instances were not the same as the resurrection of Jesus. Those were all instances of resuscitation. Each person raised was raised back to his previous state of existence. And, and eventually each one of those people died again. But when God raised Jesus from the dead, Jesus was raised to an entirely new existence. Jesus' body was transformed into something entirely different than what it was. Now, when Jesus was raised from the dead, he had real flesh and bone. He, he told the disciples, hey guys, come check me out. See, I, my flesh is real, my bones are real. And yet Jesus appeared and disappeared in a way that's not humanly possible. Jesus cooked and he ate food and he served food to his friends. I bet he even did the dishes. Brothers, you ought to help with the dishes. Be like Jesus. You ought to help with the dishes this afternoon. And all the ladies said, I just won half the crowd at least. But Jesus was also raised in a body that could travel back and forth between heaven and earth. Jesus was raised in a body that will never again experience death. And not only was Jesus' body different, Jesus was raised to a new position of authority and honor in heaven. On earth, Jesus lived in humiliation, but he was raised to a position of highest exaltation. He sits on a seat in heaven where he, all things are under his feet. No resuscitated person was ever raised to an existence like that. St. Paul and St. John call him the firstborn from the dead. That means that in his resurrected state, Jesus was the very first of his kind. Can I tell you that when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, all of heaven leaned over the balcony to behold for the first time in eternity the face of God. The Bible says that our God is an all-consuming fire. He lives in unapproachable light. No one has ever seen God and lived. Even the angels that surround God's throne crying, Holy, 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 have to 
cover their eyes with their wings. No one is permitted to look upon him. And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, all of heaven leaned forward to see the face of God for the first time. And they saw the face of a human baby whose features looked like his mother. And then when Jesus raised from the dead, all of heaven leaned forward again because no one had ever before seen a resurrected man. When the apostles saw that, when they saw Jesus in a resurrection body, they knew that tomorrow had happened today. Let me explain that for you. The Jewish people believed that when a righteous person died, his body went to the grave and his soul went to Sheol. Sheol was kind of a, a shadowy waiting place. Perhaps you could think of the, the Catholic concept of purgatory. Jesus said to the dying thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. He used that word for Sheol, that waiting place. The Jewish people looked forward to the resurrection of all the dead at the end of time itself. The prophets call it the great day of the Lord when God will judge all men. After the final judgment, God has promised that he will entirely recreate the heavens and the earth. Jesus affirmed the resurrection of the dead. He said, don't be amazed by this. A time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear God's voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. St. Paul affirmed the resurrection of the dead. He said God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, Jesus, whom he raised from the dead. Beloved, I want you to know that when you die, you will not merely cease to exist. You will not enter nirvana, and they won't be playing nirvana there, although that would be punishment. <laughs> Sorry for you nirvana fans. You won't come back a second, third, and fourth time for another go at it. The Bible says it's appointed to people to die one time, and after that to face God's judgment. When you die, you will stand before Jesus Christ and he will judge you based on the content of your life and your faith. Someone said the real question will not be what did you think of Jesus? The real question will be what does Jesus think of you? Martha believed in the final resurrection of the dead Broken-hearted, standing beside her brother's tomb, Jesus said to her, your brother will live again. She said, yes, Lord, I know that he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said, no, no, you don't understand what I'm talking about, honey. I am the resurrection and the life. I give resurrection life now. The Jewish people were certain that the resurrection belongs to the future age. The resurrection belongs to tomorrow. But when the apostles saw Jesus in a resurrected body, they said tomorrow has happened today. Something that belongs to the future has happened now. The future age has broken into this present world. St. Paul and St. John not only call Jesus the firstborn from the dead, they also call him the new beginning. You could read that, the new beginning, and the second Adam. Those words mean that Jesus' resurrection started something new. Jesus' resurrection launched a whole new era in the history of mankind and of creation. Jesus' resurrection set in motion the process that will ultimately lead to the recreation of the whole universe. Maybe there's hope for my mangy dog, Jack, after all. I don't know. In the upper room, Jesus compared his time in the tomb 
to a woman in the anguish of labor pains. But he said the anguish would be turned to joy when the new birth came. Jesus' tomb was a womb from which came the new creation. When Jesus rose from the dead, he became the progenitor of a whole new race of people on the earth. St. Peter wrote, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Paul said, behold, if any man be in Christ, he is a new, he's a new creation. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote that after the resurrection, there are now two kinds of people on the earth. There are earthly people and there are heavenly people. God has two categories now. Either you're a member of Adam's family or you're a member of Jesus' family. If you're part of Adam's family, then you are made in his sinful image. But if you've become part of Jesus' family, then you have been recreated into somethingly, something entirely new in the image of Jesus. So, so what does that mean for us specifically? It, it means that Jesus has made a whole new existence possible for us where tomorrow happens today. Jesus has made the realities and the blessings of the future era. He's made them accessible to us now. Jesus has made the righteousness that belongs to the future accessible to us now. Do you know there's no sin in heaven? Everyone perfectly obeys God all the time. John saw a heavenly vision of the new Jerusalem that's above. He wrote, nothing impure will ever enter it nor will anyone who does what's shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. There's no sin in heaven. And because tomorrow has happened today, Jesus has made it possible for us to live in obedience to God now. Now, does that mean that we get it right 100% of the time? Oh, I wish it did. It doesn't mean that, but it does mean that every day Jesus makes us just a little bit more like him. It's not our efforts to be a better person, but it's his supernatural recreating work inside of us, making us into his image day by day by day. What does it mean that tomorrow has happened today? It means that God has made it possible for us to live in the security of the coming age now. You remember what Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. You remember it. Say it with me. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let the orderliness of heaven come down to where I am. Let me experience it. Let those in my orbit. Let them experience it. Sometimes I, I travel to places in the world where there is such chaos, utter chaos. People have no concept of like standing in a nice, neat, organized queue and waiting their turn. Everybody's just pushing and shoving and, and grabbing. You go out on the roads and there's two lanes of traffic going in the same direction and there's, there's four cars abreast trying to pass each other. The intersections are chaos. And, and, and I, I, wish, I wish I could just take everybody and put them on a plane and take them to London or take them to Amsterdam and say, this is how nice and pleasant it is where there is order you know I think God looks down from heaven on our chaos and he thinks the same thing I wish I could bring you up here and just show you how beautiful it is where everything is in order let your kingdom come let your will be done on earth and let, let that orderliness of heaven, let, let it come here. In heaven, God is in complete control. In heaven, it's peace all the time. The book of Hebrews says, His is an unshakable kingdom. 
God is deeply moved about the affairs of his world, but he's not anxious. His heart is moved with compassion, but he's never shaken. And because tomorrow has happened today, we can experience that same kind of peace and order now. What does it mean? I like that. That's good preaching right there. What does it mean for us that tomorrow has happened today? Another thing, Jesus has made it possible for us to experience the supernatural power of the coming age now. In heaven, no one is sick. In heaven, no one is in pain. In heaven, no one is in need. In heaven, everyone is comforted. Every broken relationship is healed. In heaven, the devil has no authority. He can do no further damage. He can cause no further havoc or chaos. He can't harass or harm anyone anymore. And because tomorrow has happened today, we can anticipate that that same atmosphere of power and authority is going to surround us now. We can anticipate miracles of divine healing. We can anticipate divine intervention. We can anticipate God to relieve us from oppression. We can anticipate that God is going to safeguard us and those that we love. We can anticipate that he's going to give us wisdom and guidance what does it mean that tomorrow has happened today it means Jesus has made it possible for us to experience the supernatural provision of the coming age now there's no lack in heaven there's no shortage of anything heaven is a place of abundance it's a place of plenty can I tell you that the vastness of this creation, isn't it beautiful? This last week, all the blooms came out, the cherry blossoms and the Bradford pears and the purple plums. It's, and the vastness of this creation is just, just a, a foretaste of the generosity of our amazing God. Because tomorrow has happened today, we can anticipate that God will supply all of our needs, not in proportion to the need, but in proportion to his ability to provide for us. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus prayed, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. And then he prayed, say it with me, give us this day our daily bread. Do you know that Jesus' words, if they were translated literally, Jesus' words were, give us today the bread of tomorrow. Bible scholars have struggled with what to do with that. One explanation is that this was a prayer prayed by day laborers, people who, who lived hand to mouth. It was a prayer they prayed each night praying that next day God would give them the opportunity to work and the opportunity and, and the strength to work and, and to make a day's living and to feed their families. But, but what if Jesus meant something more than just a request for food? He said, God certainly will take care of our creature needs, but what if the bread of tomorrow is more than just bread? What if Jesus meant that we should pray that God will make all the realities and all the blessings of the future age available to us now? What if Jesus meant that we should pray and ask God to let us experience a sample taste of heaven now? I'm privileged once a year to go teach ministry students in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Last fall, because of the dedication of this sanctuary, my week of teaching fell a little later than usual, and the students were gearing up for graduation. Our good friend, Pastor Raymond, decided to try a new venue for the graduation banquet. So the school requested a sample tasting of the banquet food that was going to be served. Knowing that I'm a big fan of food, Pastor Raymond invited me to tag along for the sample tasting. When we got there, there was a huge banquet room with just one table in the center set exactly as it would be on the night of the banquet. 
It was dressed in a beautiful tablecloth. There was china and silver and crystal. Music was playing just as it would be on the night of the banquet. A team of waiters was dressed up just as they would be on the night of the banquet. And then they started out bring, then they started bringing out all the food. Let me tell you something. Anybody here from Malaysia today? I have any Malaysians? Let me tell you something. Malaysians know how to eat. They brought out trays of these amazing Asian appetizers. Spring rolls that were light as a feather with all these dipping sauces. Skewers of chicken and, and beef and shrimp. You getting hungry yet? <laughs> Thai dumplings and then tureens of soup. And then uh, Thai slaw salad with peanut dressing. And then the main course. Everything was served exactly as it would be the night of the event. And the best part is, it was absolutely free. <laughs> it wasn't the banquet yet, but it was a foretaste of the banquet. And maybe that helps us understand what the resurrection means for us. You see, at the end of the creation story, there will be be a great banquet. At the table, there will be all those who put their faith in Christ, in his sacrificial death, and in his resurrection. The Bible says at that banquet, God himself will be our host, and he will serve us. What an amazing, wonderful God that we worship. But in the meantime, Jesus, the firstborn from the dead, the second Adam, Jesus, the new beginning, has brought tomorrow into today. And so my life and your life is a sample tasting of heaven now. And the best part about it is it's all completely free. Jesus already picked up the tab. He paid it all in full. All we have to do is accept his invitation to dine. What does the resurrection mean for us? It means tomorrow has happened today. Let me share another thought. We're almost done. Let me share another thought quickly. What does the resurrection mean for us today? Uh, a second thought. The resurrection means that general boarding is about to begin. General boarding is about to begin. Not only is Jesus called the firstborn from the dead, but he's also called the first fruits of the resurrection. First fruits means that the very first of a crop to become ripe and ready. It's the harbinger of a, a great harvest to follow. In 1 Corinthians 15, St. Paul explains that the, the final resurrection happens in a sequence that was hidden from the Jewish people. Paul says Christ rose first on Easter Sunday, the first fruits. And then at the end of the age, all who have died in be believing in him will rise next, the general harvest. And, and finally, believers who are left alive and remaining on earth will be transformed and transported the gleanings. Jesus' resurrection means that the final resurrection has begun. It's in progress, harvest time. And it means we're the next to go. I'm absolutely convinced that air travel is one of the most inhumane methods of torture ever devised. The airlines are out to get us all. The Bible says Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, but he never had to squeeze his adult body into a 17-inch wide airplane seat and then sit for the next several hours sandwiched between two other people who also clearly do not fit in a 17-inch wide airplane seat. By the way, just so you know, we have three different size seats in this auditorium. Did you know that? Did you know? You didn't even know. You've been in here a year. We never told you. Ha <laughs> ha. There's, there's, 
There's three different size chairs in this auditorium. Some are 21 inches, some are 22, and some are 23. That's to accommodate the geometry of the room and keep the aisles straight. So listen, don't worry. If you sat down this morning and your seat felt a little tighter than it sat than it felt last week, you didn't gain any weight, okay? Uh, don't worry. It's just that last week you sat in business and this week you, you found yourself an economy seat, all right? That's, that's what it means. One of the most painful parts of air travel is the pre-boarding process. The pre-boarding process is about to begin. Denise doesn't understand why I get so uptight. I'm one of those guys who tries to sneak on before they call my boarding zone. <laughs> my boarding pass says zone nine, and I'm the guy who tries to sneak in at, with zone three. I don't wait in that big long line. Psh, are you kidding me? I'm the guy who just saunters up and just cuts right in in, in front of the line. It's easy to do when you're alone, but when I'm traveling with my whole family, it's another story. Before the pre-boarding process begins, I give them explicit line-cutting instructions. <laughs> and then I tell them, just follow me and do what I do. And I cut in line and I look over my shoulder and there's my family at the very end of the line shaking their heads. Then he says, what is wrong with you? Why are you so uptight? She doesn't understand. It's all about the battle for the overhead bin space. I want my regulation compliant carry on to be in the overhead bin over my seat. I don't want it back in row 37 when I'm sitting in row 19. I want my bag with me. Ever since those greedy airlines started charging 25 bucks to check your bag, did you ever see what people try to bring on board with them? It's ridiculous. Oh, here's my bass violin. Maybe it'll fit in the overhead bin. There's always like one petite blonde and she has an international size travel suitcase on wheels and she's gonna try and get that thing in the overhead bin and you know she can't lift it. <laughs> and you know she's gonna be in the seat right in front of you and you're gonna have to heave that thing and then everybody's gonna be looking at you saying, look at that cheap guy who was too cheap to check his bag. Actually, I, I just saw this story yesterday on AB7 News. Woman boards plane wearing nine pounds of clothing in order to avoid an $85 overweight baggage fee. <laughs> Air travel makes you messed up in your head. Air travel makes otherwise decent human beings into monsters. I have one mission. My mission is to get to the overhead bin over my seat first. And then the pre-boarding begins. People who need special assistance and active military personnel. All right, we can handle that. We're grateful for our servicemen and our service women. They deserve all the honor that we can give them. And we certainly cannot trample the elderly, so go ahead. <laughs> then people traveling with small children. Now this is where the irritation begins. <laughs> you ever been behind in security behind a woman with a stroller? It's like you better get on your app and change your flight because you're not going to make the flight. It's irritating because they shouldn't have brought those wee little ones on a trip with them. They should have left them home with grandma and grandpa and brought back a t-shirt. <laughs> and you just know that the crying baby is going to be right next to you. 
This is no lie. I was once on a 16-hour flight to Hong Kong, and there was a baby near me that cried for 15 out of those 16 hours. Every, the poor parents, they, they tried to, the stewardesses, the, 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 the passengers, sweet old grandmotherly types, every, everybody on that plane tried to calm that baby down. They sold out of all those little liquor bottles. There wasn't, there wasn't one left at the end of the, the flight, I promise you. After the elderly and the military and the wee ones, then there comes first in business. They're so elegant, aren't they? You watch them going down the jetway, and you know that by the time you get on the plane, they will have already sucked down two mimosas. <laughs> then the fun really begins. Passengers with triple platinum plus status may pre-board. Platinum plus, platinum, platinum minus may pre-board. Gold status may pre-board, gold stars, gold stickers, gold teeth, goldilocks, gold fish, go on and pre-board. Silver status, pre-board, bronze status, pre-board, copper status, nickel status, tin status, aluminum status, aluminum foil status, scrap metal status, you may pre-board the flight. By the time pre-boarding is finished and general boarding is ready to begin, the only people not on the plane is my family. <laughs> and then they say to me, sir, I'm sorry, we're going to have to gate check your regulation compliant carry-on bag because all the overhead bins are full. <laughs> but it's all right. If you're a believer in Jesus, your day is coming because of the resurrection. <laughs> Beloved, I want to tell you something. Let the resurrection of Jesus assure you of this. There is a flight that is getting ready to depart for the new Jerusalem that's above. And Jesus has already pre-boarded the plane. He was the only one with triple platinum status. He rose from the dead on the third day and he has ascended to the right hand of the Father. Pre-boarding is now complete and that means that general boarding is about to begin. You don't have to worry about any garbled announcements. A trumpet's going to sound and you're going to know it's your time to go. You don't have to worry about those overhead bins. We're not taking anything from this earth with us. Everything we we need is going to be waiting for us when we get there. You don't have to worry about cutting the line. When the trumpet sounds, we're all going to go at the same time. You don't have to worry about 17 inch wide seats. When you get there, you're going to receive a heavenly new body and you can fit in any old seat you want to sit in. You don't have to worry about crying babies because God's going to wipe every tear from their eyes himself. Jesus' resurrection means that the final resurrection has already begun. Jesus is boarded, and we're next in line. Very quickly, two things. Listen to me. This is the most important part of this whole sermon. Listen, I'm having a little fun, but now this is the most important part. You need to make sure your name is on the passenger manifest. You need to make sure that your name, you need to make sure you have a boarding pass in your hand. Beloved, listen to me. You need to make sure the people that you love, the people God has put in, the people in your life are not in your life by accident. God put those people in your life so that you can make sure that they have their boarding pass and they're ready as well. How do we get on board that flight? We get on board through faith in Jesus Christ. There's a moment of believing on Jesus. You might not understand it all. You might have lots of questions. I've been studying this for 30-something years, and I still have lots of questions. I'm making a list for when I get to heaven. That doesn't matter. All that matters is in the deepest place inside of you, 
you know that you know that it's true. You know that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died and that he rose again for us. There's a moment of believing. In that moment, all of our sins are lifted off of us and they're placed on Jesus on the cross and his resurrection life comes and fills us and begins making us into a new creation ready to take that flight ready to take that trip on this Easter Sunday morning my question is are, are you ready to go do you have your boarding pass in hand have you believed on Jesus what does the resurrection mean for us tomorrow has happened today general boarding is about to begin one more thought very quickly and we're done. Worship team, help me. One more thought and we're done. Jesus' resurrection means that we should live leaning forward into the future. When Jesus rose from the dead, he set in motion the process that will eventually culminate with the recreation of everything. I want you to understand that the destinies of humankind and the destinies uh, of all of creation are intertwined with one another. When our first parents fell into sin, it plunged all of creation into disorder. St. Paul says that creation was subjected to frustration and to corruption. It's funny that we call natural disasters acts of god god may, left everything in perfect working order it was sin and satan that messed it all up i had a tree that one time a huge branch fell during a storm and crushed the roof of my nissan pathfinder i called the insurance company and the agent said that was an act of god i said god's a friend of mine he wouldn't do that to me Turns out she was a Christian. She went to Pastor Rick Amendola's church in Massachusetts. He was the first assistant pastor here at harvest time. We had a great conversation about Jesus and then she didn't pay my claim. <laughs> Why do we call it an act of God? He left everything in perfect working order. We messed it up, but there's hope. When the final resurrection occurs, creation will also be restored. Paul said, in the meantime, creation groans in expectation. And listen to this. Paul says, even we, even we who have the daily help of the Holy Spirit, even we groan eagerly awaiting the final resurrection. Even we who experience the blessings of tomorrow today, even we who eat the bread of tomorrow today, even we who know that general boarding is about to begin, even we groan sometimes living in this sin-broken world. And so we live in such a way that we are eagerly awaiting the call. Those words eagerly await in Romans 8.28, uh, 8.23, they, they, they mean to, to crane your neck. It's like when the 703 from Koskob uh, to Grand Central is late and you crane your neck looking out for it. That's how we, that's how we live. You see, this is the terminal. Sometimes terminals are great. Sometimes they make us groan, but either way, terminals are places for transit. They are not final destinations. I never once landed in Heathrow and thought to myself, you know, this is nice. I think I'll just spend the week right here. I never once arrived in Amsterdam and, and spent a week in Schiphol Airport. If you have an extra hour or two, they have a wonderful Dutch Masters Museum. I brought home a, a beautiful print that's in our dining room. It's a nice place to visit, but it is not a destination. I've never arrived in Hong Kong airport and decided to stay right there at the food court. Dubai has an amazing airport, but I didn't stay there one minute 
longer than necessary. As soon as my flight was ready to board, I was out of there. Beloved, Jesus' resurrection tells us that we should live he life here on earth leaning into the future. There's beauty here. There's meaning and there's purpose here. There are great things to see and taste and experience. There's love here, but there is also groaning here. Maybe you heard on the news that earlier this morning, 125 Christians were martyred in Sri Lanka and 300 others wounded in Easter Sunday church bombings. Our hearts groan. But on those days that make us groan, that's when we need to lean into the future. That's when we need to ask our Father to give us today some of that bread of tomorrow. That's when we need to begin to remind ourselves that general boarding is just about to begin. On those days that make us groan, we need to remind ourselves we are just passing through here. Our final destination is in the arms of the one who loved us and who gave his life for us and who rose again. What does the resurrection mean for us? It means tomorrow has happened today. It means general boarding is about to begin and we should lean forward into the future. Would you stand and give Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place this morning?